Hi everyone. Uh, this is a screencast uh, that will give you guys notes on the Crusades. Uh, we're running out of time in class, so the quickest way to get through the notes and to give you the facts is to have you guys copy these notes down at your leisure. So if you orient your paper with the arrow towards the right hand side, you will see that this is how the timeline goes. Now this doesn't look like a typical timeline because it's got what looks like mountains um, and valleys in there and it's actually modeled after the electrocardiograph machine which measures a heartbeat and everything that's going up is something positive for the Christians. Everything that is going down is something negative for the Christians. So if we were to look at the Crusades through the eyes of the Muslims, the timeline would look very different. Now up at the top center of your paper we need to go ahead and write the title. The Crusades, EKG Timeline. Now, I do have some of you that do write really large, so it's important that you keep your writing um, small, normal size, maybe a little bit on the smaller side to make sure that everything fits on here. Okay. So now I'm going to zoom in so we can start writing down details. Um, if you look at your cause and effect chart that you have on how did the Crusades begin, you guys already know that the first blow actually came from the Muslims. So the Muslim Turks attacked the Byzantine Empire. So it was the Muslims who threw the first punch, and it was the Byzantine emperor who didn't have enough money or troops, and so he asked the pope for some help, and so the pope called on the kings and lords of Europe to send knights, who were going to be called crusaders, over to free the Holy Land. Now right where it says Muslim Turks, let's go ahead and draw the symbol for Islam, which is a crescent moon and the star. And right where it says Byzantine Empire, let's go ahead and draw the symbol for Christianity which is the cross. And because we're looking at the origin of the Crusades, right above where it says Muslim Turks, let's go ahead and draw the thinking tool for origin. Okay, so the Crusades begins with the Muslim Turks attacking the Byzantine Empire. Now, if you have your flow map in front of you, you guys should have for the First Crusade some of the details that I'm going to be writing on here. Okay, now, when we write the title for the First Crusade, you're going to want to go up I'm not sure, maybe an inch or two, so that you have room to write about three or four bullets underneath where it says First Crusade. So the First Crusade was from 1095 to 1099. And this crusade was actually a success for the Christians. You can tell because it's actually going up on the timeline. The Christians captured... Antioch which is in Syria, and Nicaea, which is not in your book. So the Crusaders actually captured some Christian territories, or some territories, and then made them into Christian states. So they created four Christian states. So the first one is the kingdom of Jerusalem, which was the very place that the Pope uh, told them to get when he told them to launch a crusade. So the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Then we have Edessa, Tripoli, and then Antioch. So this was actually a very positive thing for Christians because they got the land that the Pope wanted them to and Jerusalem being the holiest city for the Christians, they actually made that into a Christian city during the First Crusade. Now, when there's war, you guys know that people die, so it shouldn't be any surprise that Christians and Muslims died during this battle, but what should be surprising is that the Jews were also killed. Okay, so Christians... Muslims and Jews were killed. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the second crusade. So the first crusade being a total victory for the Christians. In fact, it's the highest peak on your timeline. So this should indicate to you that this was the largest victory for them. So... 
taken a look now at the second crusade, we already know that something good or something um, bad happens because it's going down. So for the second crusade, it's actually got several dates because they fought for a while and then they took a break and then they took up the fighting again. So 1147 to 1149 and then 1179 to 1189. So two-part break for the Second Crusade. Now, what makes the Second Crusade, or the turning point for the Christians during the Second Crusade, was when Saladin became commander of the Egyptian army. Because Saladin was a ruthless, um, very strategic leader, and so he was able to gain or take back the lands that the Christians won during the First Crusade. So Saladin and his armies recaptured Jerusalem, the Christians lost Edessa during this battle as well. So if you look at the First Crusade, these were the two territories that the Christians got, but then they promptly lost it during the Second Crusade. Now, the Crusaders tried to regain the lost lands, but the Second Crusade was a total failure. Now, what your book doesn't tell you is during the Second Crusade, there is also the slaughter of Jews in the Rhineland. And the Rhineland is where modern-day Germany is. And if you were to take a look at a map, you guys would see that Germany is nowhere near where Jerusalem and Dessa are. So um, the Jews are being killed during the Second Crusade when this is not a battle uh, with the Jews. It's actually a religious war between the Christians and the Muslims. Now you guys can see that there is one small little victory for the Second Crusade. And this is where the Christians recaptured a small territory that the Muslims had gotten. So the Christians recaptured Lisbon, which is on the Spanish Peninsula, from the Muslims. And this was called the Reconquista, which is Spanish for reconquering. So the Christians gained a little bit of land on the Spanish Peninsula, which is technically part of the European continent, but they lost Jerusalem and Edessa. So this is why the Second Crusade is considered a failure. Now, moving on to the Third Crusade, you can see that there's also bad things that happened, and you can also see that there's one good thing that happened, and it is the very last good thing that happens for the Crusaders. Okay, so for third, the Third Crusade, We have 1187 to 1192. This third crusade was nicknamed the King's Crusade because the major leaders of kingdoms and empires decided that it was now their turn to take up the cross and go fight the war. So you had leaders like Frederick and Richard I and King Philip that, you know, gathered their army of lords and knights and went off to fight. Now, on your flow map, you guys would have written down or should have written down that Frederick drowned while trying to cross a river. So um, poor Frederick, and your book doesn't indicate this to you, but but uh, King Frederick was 70 years old when he decided he was going to pick up you know, his weapons, put on an armor, get on a horse, also wearing armor, and go off to war. It's akin to your grandparents deciding that they're going to pick up a gun and go off to Afghanistan and fight against the Taliban. I mean, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, and but it should tell you how motivated Emperor Frederick was because he was willing to go to war in his very old age. So as he was on his way to uh, the fight, he was actually drowned while trying to cross a river and you think about it he's seven years old he's wearing armor he's on a horse also wearing armor and then he tries to cross a river I mean it really is a recipe for disaster now the Crusaders did capture a small port city which is a good thing and the port city was called Accra 
And for those of you that have Mrs. Arce, it's not Arce, it's Acra. It's spelled very similar to her name, but the letters are are uh, flipped around. They captured a port city called Acra, but they were unable to regain any lost lands. Now, the good thing about capturing Acre is that they could actually see Jerusalem from the city of Acre, so they could gather their troops with their supplies and get their armies ready to go and hopefully reconquer Jerusalem. Now, King Frederick I went to fight King or Emperor Philip, or King Philip, I can't remember what his title was, went to fight as well. Philip returned home, nothing you know extraordinary happened to him. But Richard I, on his way home, he actually went by boat through the Mediterranean Sea, and his boat actually uh, crashed, and so he was shipwrecked, and then he was kidnapped and held for ransom by fellow Christians. So King Richard was shipwrecked, Kidnapped and held for ransom. And the fact that this is, or this was done by fellow Christians, should kind of make you wonder what the heck is going on. Because this guy who fought bravely for the Christians, you know, and survived the battle is on his way home. And then instead of, you know, helping him out when he shipwrecked, they actually kidnap him and hold him for ransom. And Richard, the first family, did pay the ransom because they wanted their king back. Now, if you look at the next thing on our timeline, like I said, it is the last positive thing. And it actually involves King Richard and Saladin. So King Richard the first and Saladin signed a treaty. To allow Christian pilgrims safe passage to Jerusalem for a period of five years. Okay. And this treaty was signed in the year 1192, so at the end of the Third Crusade. Now, during this time period of war between Christians and Muslims, I mean, there were still Christians that wanted to go to Jerusalem to pay homage to Jesus, to see where he was born, to see where he was crucified. I mean, they wanted to go on a pilgrimage, and it was really just for religious reasons. So King Richard negotiated a treaty where Saladin agreed that if the Christians came as a pilgrim to visit the Holy Land, as long as they didn't pick up any weapons and start killing people, well, then they could have safe passage to Jerusalem and then back home. Now, of course, the treaty was only good for five years, which meant after the year 1197, um, basically anything goes if Christians are found in the city of Jerusalem. Now, the next uh, crusade that we're looking at is the Fourth Crusade. So the Fourth Crusade is where it starts to go really wrong for the Christians. So the Fourth Crusade, 1202 to 1204. So during the Fourth Crusade, you have Venetian merchants who are now involved. Now you have to wonder why are merchants, or why are we talking about merchants when this is a war between Christians and Muslims? So this is why it gets a little weird. Venetian merchants who were interested in getting the trade from China, they actually wanted to destroy their trading rivals. So they wanted to... Destroy their trading rivals. Who coincidentally was the Byzantine Empire. And if you look at the origin of the Crusades, that is the same Christian Empire that asked for help in the first place. So this is where, like I said, it starts to go really wrong for the Crusaders because now we're not talking about, you know, Christians fighting Muslims. We're talking about merchants who are thinking about how do we get the trade to come to our port city away from Constantinople. So the Venetian merchants were able to convince the Crusaders, who, by the way, were not getting paid because there wasn't a whole lot 
lot of money available when you're buying horses and armor and supplies to go off to war, the Venetian merchants told the crusaders, whatever you get from Constantinople, you get to keep. So the crusaders take the merchants up on their offer. So the crusaders sacked and looted Constantinople. So they destroyed the city, they stole whatever they could, and that kind of became their, their reward for their fighting. Even though they're not defending the Christians against the Muslims, they're actually destroying a fellow Christian group who are the trading rivals to the Venetians. Now, back in Italy, the Pope is very furious. So Pope Innocent was furious at hearing the news that merchants are convincing crusaders to destroy a Christian city who asked for help in the first place, but there was little he could do because he didn't have his own military. I mean, he's the leader of the Catholic Church, so he's not that type of a, a military leader. Okay, So that's the fourth crusade. Now, the next crusade that we're going to look at is some historians believe don't actually exist, but I'm going to highlight it because, to me, there is a question that it may Okay, and this is actually called the Children's Crusade. Now, this crusade happened in the year 1212. The reason why I think this, that this crusade could have possibly happened is because you have a large number of children who simply disappeared within a one-year time span in history, and you have to wonder, where did they go? Okay, so in the year 1212, approximately... 37,000 French and German children left Europe. Now, where did these children go? I mean, honestly, I couldn't tell you for sure, but 37,000 children, that's a lot. Our school itself is a little over 1,000 students strong, so 37,000 children leaving uh, from France and from Germany, where did they go? My guess is, you know, they've watched their brothers or uncles or dads. They've heard stories about their grandparents and great-grandparents who fought in the Crusades and never came back. So maybe this was their chance to, you know, take up the cross, get a sword, and, and do what they could to try and free the Holy Land from the Muslims. Now, because this is going down, you guys know that we're talking about bad stuff here. So for the Children's Crusade, a lot of children supposedly died in shipwrecks. So on their way to Jerusalem by boat through the Mediterranean Sea, their ships crashed, never to be heard from again. Children also died of starvation. They didn't have enough food with them or water or supplies. Some lucky children, and I put lucky in quotes, were adopted by families along the route which was nice because at least they had someone to take care of them. But the thing is, is those children never went back home again. They never saw their parents. But at least they're still alive. And then this is the sad thing, and this is what I think happened to the majority of them, is that they were sold into slavery in Egypt. Never to be heard from again. So... You know, for the Children's Crusade, I've had students in the past ask, well, did any children make it to the, you know, to the fight in Jerusalem? I don't honestly know. Maybe. I mean, 37,000 children, that's a lot. But the majority of children never actually made it into battle. The rough ages of the children that went on this uh, crusade would have been um, as young as 10, maybe up to 15, 16 years old. So pretty young to be going off to war. Now, the last crusade that we're going to highlight here is the Fifth Crusade. And this was in the year 1216. Now, the reason why this timeline ends here with an arrow going out to the right is because after the Fifth Crusade, every single crusade has the exact same results. So there's no point in repeating the same things over and over again because it's the same result. So during the Fifth Crusade... The Crusaders attacked Cairo. And if you remember your sixth grade history, Cairo is in Egypt, nowhere near Jerusalem. 
but it is the same place where Saladin came from, and it is a place where, according to the children's the information for the Children's Crusade, that the children were sold into slavery to Egypt. So maybe the Crusaders were trying to go after the children. I don't really know. But the fact is, is they attacked Cairo, but they retreated because they ran out of supplies. So they ran out of food, they ran out of water, they ran out of weapons, and then the end result is they failed to regain any lost lands. So the result for the Fifth Crusade is the same as the Second Crusade in that they're trying to get their land, but they failed to regain it. So we could have kept this timeline going on. Historians uh, think that there might be as many as 14 Crusades. Some historians say, you know, we'll end it after the Tenth Crusade. But if we were to take a look at all these different Crusades, the only things that would change would be the year that they attacked and where they attacked, but the results were the same. They were traded because they ran out of supplies and they failed to regain any lost lands. So um, this is why we're stopping the timeline here because the pattern for the Fifth Crusade just repeats until finally the Christians realize, hey, we're not going to win a battle. Now, if you look at your overall timeline, you guys can see that the last battle that the Christians really won was the very first one. And then every single crusade after that, according to this timeline, is one failure after another. I mean, a couple of good things with the Reconquista and the Treaty, but other than that, just one bad thing after another for the Christians. So this is our timeline for the crusades. It's very abbreviated. I didn't go into all the details. Um, but make sure that you have all these notes down because in class we're going to be looking at the impact of the Crusades where you're going to have to draw some pictures, okay?